know what really makes us mad? Is wasting money on CDs with only one or two good songs. Yeah. Tell them about punk. What's up, hosers? Welcome to Punk Lotto Pod. I'm your co-host, Justin Hensley. I'm your other co-host, Dylan Hensley. And this is the show where we choose one year at random and select one punk, hardcore, emo, or punk-adjacent album from that year to discuss. Do you guys like how I always introduce myself on this show in my, like, John Hamm voice? I'm Dylan Hensley. And then the rest <laughs> of the show, I'm like, it's kind of like, it's a, I don't like it. Um... <laughs> You thought you were doing John Ham? I just, I'm always in like a lower <laughs> register and I'm like, I get up real close to the mic so you get all that proximity effect. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just like, and I'm a radio announcer. <laughs> like, but then don't follow through with that but delivery. That's not, how I, yeah, that's not how I talk. Once I start talking normal, I'm just like, it gets higher and higher and higher. <laughs> Does your voice get higher as we go on? I guess I the, like the, it does. <laughs> the louder we get, the higher our voices get. Depending on the subject, we'll get like higher energy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I my favorite part is where like we enter the show and you say your name and then you don't talk for like 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm here because I'm doing the plug machine, especially with guests. It's really funny with guests because like it's always it's always like we've been talking for like a good while with the guest before you're like, actually, that's really interesting. And it's just, it's well, like, we oh, usually, I forgot he was there. <laughs> we're usually talking to the guest before we start the show and having a little bit of a conversation. And then you have like the interview where you have these prepared questions. And I'm like, I don't know what the questions are. I have nothing prepared to respond to what they're saying. So it's like, unless I have something to like in the moment, respond to what they're saying to like, and it's usually just kind of like, asking for like a, a modification or, you know, like a clarification on something, just being like, Oh, do you mean like this? And then they go on and like, but <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I don't do the interview portion of the, of having a guest on the show. So I need to start like sharing the list of questions with you in advance. So it's like, Oh, Dylan, you had a question you wanted to ask, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm That's just fine. asking one of the questions that you prepared. <laughs> I've prepared these questions for you. Do you think that um, when you recorded this, <laughs> you were thinking of, what does that say? <laughs> I typed it. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving me handwritten notes. Please take a picture of it. <laughs> Yellow legal pad. I definitely, there's that part of me that is like, romanticizes the yellow legal pad as being like oh yeah yeah or like a composition notebook but really i just type everything in my phone yeah i have notebooks notepads and things that i like i will start writing on them and then i have them for like i have some that i've probably had for like eight years i probably have like a moleskin or something that i've had for like eight years because i'm like no you can't just write just anything in it it has to be special <laughs> I think I'm the same way. I'm like, I have to keep this. Like, it can't just be like a thing that you wrote like your grocery list in. And then, but then you go look back at things that you wrote and you're like, why the fuck did I write that in here? <laughs> why didn't I save it in my notes app? <laughs> and yeah. And then there's also just the impracticality of like keeping notebooks on you all the time. It's like because whenever I think of something that I'm going to want to like refer to later it, I need it to be on my phone. Like, my phone is what I have on me all the time. Notebooks, uh, they need to be for very specific purposes. And then you use them for that, and then they're done. Journaling. Yeah. Lyrics writing. Yeah, you're like, I'm going to hand write out everything. You know, like. Yeah. I do write a lot on legal pads at work. A lot of, like, writing down times and transmitter readings and stuff like that. That's. So that I get my fill of like writing that down, get to use military time a lot at work and uh, the like the six digit zero zero colon zero zero colon, you know, like that weird skills. Yeah. Yeah. A <laughs> uh, little little weird way to start this episode off. But 
If you head over to our Patreon, you get access to all of our weekly bonus audio. No segue. Just start talking about it. Uh, for one dollar, you can get access to all the bonus audio we have. We definitely have like 200 posts or more on the Patreon. So, like, I feel like you get bang for your buck, your literal buck, one dollar that that we charge to join the Patreon. There's a lot of audio there. If you are going on an Antarctic expedition or something <laughs> like that, we've got content for you. You can <laughs> sign up for a dollar and download all of that. <laughs> we've only used like a fraction of a percent of our like data limit. The Patreon offers anyway, which which means they offer you like terabytes worth of <laughs> data. Yeah. Well, they're probably expecting people to do like lots of video content, too, or like they at least want to have that option for people that are doing lots of like data heavy stuff yeah true that is, that is a possibility because you can like upload actual videos to it the way we do our videos on there is just a youtube link though which it embeds on the page so it's not even taking up any of our storage space to do that speaking of moon pies for misfits is the youtube series that i have uh that's only private that you can only get on the patreon and I actually just did one. I haven't posted it yet. I need to I need to do that, but you can get access to that. This week's bonus audio, last week's bonus audio uh, was a news of the world where we talk about the news stories over the last couple weeks. And the new release update, my former new release Friday audio has returned on a different day of the week. And we've done two of those so far as of recording, planning to do another one next week, but or this week as of release. Really fun trying to like talk around release schedules and when things are coming out. But all that's at patreon.com slash punkladapod. So we wrapped up Skagist last week and at the very end of it came up with a little bit of a, a, a plan for the weeks leading up to our 250th episode. We already know what we're going to do for the 250. It's very silly. I can't wait to do it. But I was like, OK, I don't want to do like a whole theme month for September because we're going to do one in October anyway. So. Instead of just being like, we'll just pick something random. I like the idea of doing these kind of challenges is how I, I've labeled them, where like we have like a, we, we're choosing the year at random, but kind of setting parameters on what albums to talk about. So we chose the year on air at random last week, and it was the year 1989. And my challenge to you was to find a debut full length album. I don't think I said full length, but we wound up just only talking about full length albums and turns out 1989 a is very difficult to find albums to talk about and b even harder whenever you uh put a parameter around it saying you can only choose debut albums yeah 89 so if we didn't have the limitation of a debut 89 generally speaking is a year where it's kind of an identity crisis year for punk, I think, mm -hmm. is is a way to categorize it. There are certain years and certain eras where it's like punk is a lot of different things. And like a lot of it doesn't look very much like what you knew punk to be for like the 10 years preceding that moment. And, it, you know, naturally, the end of a decade, that feels that feels like the right time for any genre to be going through like reinvention and kind of like exploration. And so it makes since but it's also like far enough back now that we have like the influence of what happened then on the next three decades plus and we see a lot of stuff here that's like kind of falls into that punk adjacent category but it's also like comes with so much like other genre like baggage and like you're just like you know grunge like grunge is you know we know that grunge is punk influence but it's like it is modern rock radio for my entire childhood so like to me like it's something that i knew before i knew what punk was and then there's like crossover thrash stuff and 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 other like metal related stuff and it's like that to me is so firmly metal coded that it's just like man we'd really have to be stretching to pick something that wasn't a debut so then factor on top of that we have that like what's the first album by a band <laughs> yeah that, 
that you can even properly classify as punk. Yeah. Yeah, 89, we've covered in the past like a couple different times, and every time I'm like, woof, what do we got to talk about? And so, yeah, like, uh, uh, basically playing 89 on hard mode, you, you're you not left with a lot of options to really talk about. Yeah. So, like, as far as debut records that, that make the Rate Your Music Punk chart, there's Bleach by Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, what I said about grunge, I've listened to that record earlier this year after having never listened to it prior, only really knowing maybe a couple songs from it. That record is probably the most punk grunge record ever made, I would hmm. say. I, like, I would say that to me feels the closest to like the punk influence on grunge than anything else I've ever heard. I yeah. That's probably true, because like the only other thing I can think of is if you go in the direction of like a punk band who has grunge elements, like that's the only other thing, like a seaweed or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, and yeah, seaweed. I I think of seaweed as a punk band or as a post hardcore band or whatever. Right. You know, but it, yeah, I just it didn't feel like the right choice for me, for me. Plus the recency of us just talking about it on like an I'm listing like last month, you know, yeah. I was just like, yeah, we probably don't need to do that one yet. I mean, there's other Nirvana records that I think show up on these punk charts that we could probably get away with talking about anyway. I'd rather do, you know. Yeah. I'd, ra- I'd rather cover Nirvana or uh, Nevermind or In Utero, you know. Yeah. And there's always the potential for someone to pick a Nirvana record to just be like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do Nirvana. Yeah. Whenever we decide to have guests again. I think that'll be whenever I uh, get on day shifts. <laughs> It's worth mentioning here, but I really did not even briefly consider it. <laughs> Tweez by Slint is their first album. And let's throw in, while we're on the noise rock, math rock, you know, bent, Bitch Magnet released their first LP, Umber. And I, my, you know, you didn't even consider it for a minute. And then when I saw like the Bitch Magnet record, I was like, well, that's not even the Bitch Magnet record to do. I, but I was also like, man, we've covered so many of these kind of bands over the last year. <laughs> like, we've done Chavez, we've done Crown Hate Ruin, we've done, who else did we do? Shiner, we've done a lot of bands that fall into this category. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't really too interested in doing anything that was like post-hardcore in that like very uh, cerebral category. Like I, like if there was a Fugazi record. Which there, like, there's a Fugazi EP, but it's not even the first one. <laughs> so I was like, damn, I can't even do that. Like, the first Fugazi EP was 88. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't specify album, like, full length. And so we did actually talk EPs for a minute, and it was just like, none of these really yeah. are close. There was nothing, I don't think there was anything at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like, none of them were their first. Or they, like, weren't substantial. It was like not enough songs to even bother talking about (laughs) yeah like four songs (laughs) scar scar by lush that like that's probably the the biggest contender but we've talked about lush on the show so and it's yeah one of the big like truly noteworthy debut albums to come out in 1989 was operation ivy's energy it's definitely worth considering but the fact that we had literally just finished Skagist. I guess we could have used it as like a backdoor like now we transition from Skagist because it's still technically August when this episode goes up. Yeah. And into the next theme. It would have but, been the the bonus Skagist. The Skagist debut album two week <laughs> uh crossover event. That's a hat on a hat. Like we don't need to keep doing <laughs> like gimmick on top of gimmick for that. <laughs> don't worry. Operation Ivy will probably get their day very easily in a uh future Skagas, you know, especially if we get guests on, you know, the offspring by the offspring, uh, immediate disqualification because we just talked about the offspring. <laughs> yeah. And I'm always talking about the offspring. So I don't he's expect ne- to see like a full episode on the offspring for a long time. <laughs> he's never not talking about the offspring. Yeah. If you head over to the Patreon, listen to an I'm listening. I talked about another offspring album. So, <laughs> 
it's a good record though like it's enjoyable uh they were definitely were still on that like well it's their first record so they were heavy into the bad religion and agent orange sound so like it's straight up skate punk stuff so it's cool it's good but not what anybody even really knows and we don't need that much offspring content from me though should we start one of those (laughs) every song by the offspring a to z podcast those are kind of dying out though because every song podcast where like you devote an episode to a different song in the discography there are a lot of albums on here where i was just like is that the first record by them and no it's not like (laughs) i kept being like oh that'd be cool oh it's not it's like their third album (laughs) yeah yeah like that all records not the first all record Mm -hmm. that's definitely not the first Lemonheads record (laughs) i guess if we keep it on the same bent of what we are talking about judge is bringing it down that's their first record but like i don't know i don't really care about judge (laughs) and sick of it all's blood sweat and no tears that would be uh, that's kind of like the first official record Radio Music has this, like, I don't know what this is. They have, like, a self-titled listed before in 1986, but it's, it's like, a self-titled, and it has in, like, parentheses, like, the words uh, promotional demo. <laughs> so I guess it's a demo. Why would you call it promotional demo? This stupid website. So this would have been, like, the first full-length album. So that, that ties, like, our main album, the Judge record, and sick of it all, like, the New York hardcore debut albums i guess it's a big year for that yeah yeah that is that is true it is i mean it's the right time period yeah for that that wave of new york hardcore bands one that i did kind of consider the only three album dark days coming well, I don't care. could be interesting to talk about but it's three (laughs) so you know it's not gray matter you know it's not it's the also ran i mean it's interesting i guess in so far that it's kind of the it's one of the it's one of the connective tissue bands from revolution summer to like the ongoing version of emo emo core you know and and what would um what would eventually culminate in like your sunny day real estate wave of emo who uh, three is always the one I forget which, which members it. So it's, yeah, it's the gray matter, like post gray matter band. Right. Yeah. And Jeff Nelson, you know, the discord co-founder. And it leans more in that gray matter, dag nasty kind of style of emo, if you call it that. But I mean, it's a good record. I do like that album, but yeah, you're right. It's like one that you're just like, it's, it's not the biggest thing we could have done from the year and i do think we actually did probably choose is it the biggest is it the most important debut album from this year i mean i guess it depends on how much you say bleach is important but i don't think bleach is nearly as important as nevermind is is it i don't know op ivy kind of launched yeah yeah i guess third wave ska i mean it's kind of them and mighty mighty wildstones but yeah which one which one had the longer lasting impact I don't know. It's hard to say. I do think that they're both pretty extensive impact. I mean, they could just be the 1A, 1B of the debut albums in 1989, because really out of anything else we've mentioned, like, yeah, I don't think comes even close. And not in not in terms of ultimately not in terms of influence on this record, but I guess it's worth throwing out there that uh, Leatherface's debut, Cherry Knoll, came out in 89. So that would have been a cool one to do if we hadn't already done Mush. Um, yeah. But it's, you know, first five Leatherface records are essentially the same. <laughs> the first one is probably the most different out of those others because it's like the scratchiest and like roughest around the edges. But it's still them. Like they they, they had their sound kind of like, yeah. you know, distilled already. So makes sense, which makes sense, too, because of what the, the previous band that some of them were in like HDQ, I think is what they were called. And like they were the proto Leatherface in sound anyway. So like it makes sense why they would be like essentially fully formed by the time the first Leatherface album comes out. Will you want to get into it? Sure. All right. So 
I challenged you to find a debut album from 1989 for us to talk about. And you selected Start Today by the Gorilla Biscuits. City, formed in 1986. <laughs> New York City! <laughs> Do the next generation get that? Uh, they don't listen to our show, but... No, the people who listen to our show get that joke. <laughs> yeah. That and what do you want on your tombstone? Like, those two <laughs> things. <laughs> they're, they're, like, tied to each other in my brain. But yes, Skrilla Biscuits formed in 1986. This is the band's debut full-length album. Very important. Recorded at Demo 2 Studios in New York City between January and April of 1989. Released on Revelation Records. I couldn't find a actual release date for this record. Nope. It all just says 1989. And I, to specifically mention, I watched a live set from 1989 I think it was from like June of 1989 and they were playing mainly stuff from the EP. Like they played some songs off of start today, but they, they said in the videos is, Oh, we have a new record out coming out or it might be out. I don't know if it's out here yet. And they were in Reseda, California. So uh-huh. that it makes me think that it's, it just wasn't out everywhere. Distribution must've been pretty slow back then, but so no hard date on when it actually came out. My guess is, Sometime after June. Second quarter. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, they're playing in June and they're like, it's out. Maybe that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You uh, could the person, probably say there's probably like a month lag. Yeah. Sounds like a summer record. But. Yeah. Personnel on this album is Anthony Siv Civarelli on vocals. Walter Schreifels on guitar. Alex Brown on guitar. Arthur Smilios on bass and Luke Abbey on drums. And the album was produced by the band and Don Fury. Same year, Don Fury also worked on albums by Alone in the Crowd, Bad Trip, Underdog, The Corvairs, Trip Six, Blood Sister, and the Connecticut Slipknot, the original Slipknot. And then in 1989, Revelation also put out albums by Judge, Chain of Strength, Bold, Slipknot, and Youth of Today. So definitely a big period for Revelation Records hardcore bands. And uh, this one being probably one of the biggest. So tell me. Why did you select Start Today? Well, it's, yeah, it's the 1A, 1B of influential debut records from 1989. I mean, it is one of the biggest records. And like kind of as I was saying with like all of the stuff that's like that the debut records that were out were like grunge, were experimental rock, math rock, you know, that kind of thing. I wanted to pick something that felt pretty quintessentially punk to talk about so op ivy was one of the big contenders as well but and there's just there's not a lot to choose from in general and so this one really is kind of you know the process of elimination was very easy to land on this one but in terms of like of the big records that i could have chosen between even if you know if you narrowed it down to the two like this is the one that resonates the most with me and to my history with punk and so i figured that's more interesting to explore because like op ivy important influential i listened to them pretty early on but they didn't really stick with me long term and i think i think gorilla biscuits is a band that i spent a good bit of time with 
over you know the span of several years listening to them and i think that this is a good record to talk about i think it's a good record to talk about in terms of hardcore because we've talked about hardcore we talked about it in its indecision record recently and we were both kind of like hardcore is kind of hard to talk about and i think this is a hardcore record that's pretty easy to talk about actually so figured there's a lot to say about it yeah whenever i was thinking about it like i haven't we're gonna select my year at the very end of the episode to to determine which one which year i have to choose a debut album from and like this is even a year where you could be like well i wanted to talk about my pet favorite like one that you're like oh this is a deep cut but i fucking love it let's talk about that one you know like that'd be cool 1989 does not have a lot of like stuff where like you go super deep on like and the ones I would have it wasn't even their debut album like <laughs> the hated put out every song that year and that was like their second LP so yeah. it's like not even I couldn't even go deep cut on this year if I wanted to yeah the deepest would be Leatherface and yeah you're right Mush is a record that we've covered before and Starter Day is pretty pretty fucking important uh, it's a huge huge album stood the test of time uh, I believe it's credited as the highest selling record on Revelation Records. Uh, they sold like 100,000 copies on CD alone. And it's also the first CD that Revelation actually put out. And yeah, it's um, it's really important from a culture standpoint, like of the hardcore culture, just sonically. And it's one that resonates today probably more strongly than like those judge or sick of it all records those records are well loved but i think this one this one almost transcends hardcore i feel like sick of it all and judge are for more like only listen to hardcore kind of guys and uh gorilla biscuits actually appeal to like a much wider range of like punk umbrella fans judge judge feels like an exclusively straight edge hardcore fan yeah there's they're straight edge, right? Uh, they could be. Uh, I think a lot of those first wave Revelation bands were. They're, they're generally associated with straight edge, but, right? But I don't think that they're like, I guess they didn't call themselves a straight edge band, but like members but it's, of the band were straight edge, right? Yeah, it's it's Porcel from Youth of Today, isn't it? Yeah. They may be, they may be, maybe were straight edge. I don't know. You know, Mike Ferraro explains militant straight edge lyrics. Yeah. Right. I mean, they were criticized for it in Maximum Rock and Roll. So, I mean, their band camp says Northeast straight edge hardcore. So, yeah. OK, they were they were they were straight edge. I think like the whole like youth crew movement was essentially straight edge. Yeah. Maybe not entirely, but mostly. So, yeah, Judge, I think, too, was another straight edge. Yeah. Yeah. Judge being a judge and like chain of strength. Like yeah. this is that's like crew cut sweatshirt bands like that's how i think of them guy who lives exclusively in a judge hoodie (laughs) yeah kind of guy kind of fan sick of it all to me feels more like maybe a guy with flame tattoos (laughs) sick of it all is a tattoo band right they're a dragon tattoo band they have the logo i remember because when we were teenagers my dad our dad came home from work one day and he said, look up this band and this video because he saw a guy at work that had a tattoo. He had a sick of it all tattoo, which is very funny to me because it was like rural ass North Carolina trucking company. And this yeah. dude's got a sick of it all tattoo. It's very funny to me. Like you're a transplant. Like that, that's not a North Carolina tattoo guy thing. That's a, <laughs> that's a transplant from another state tattoo guy. But and then my dad saw the video and was like, oh, never mind. I don't like this. So. Yeah. <laughs> Which I don't know why he thought he would like the music of a band that a tractor trailer mechanic got a tattoo. <laughs> of. Yeah. I don't think he generally liked the people that he worked with. <laughs> no, no. Our dad didn't have a lot of work friends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't want to hang out with most of the people that I work with. I see them enough. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I've never gotten the work where you hang out with everyone you work with all the time. Yeah. I don't get that. You should move in with one. That's what I did. Uh, yeah. Gr- yeah. <laughs> so Gorilla Biscuits. Yeah. Gorilla Biscuits to me probably has the broadest appeal. I mean, they're 
I'll say this much: they're they're significant and in, and influential enough, and you know, sold so well that they really became kind of an entry level punk band. And I don't mean that in the dismissive way that we sometimes mean that. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, Baby's first punk band. Yeah, they're not like uh, standard issue. Like here you go. Uh, this is the first things you have to listen to. This isn't Misfits, Dead Kennedys, and Ramones, you know. Which I love the Ramones, and I've come, I've warmed back up to the Dead Kennedys more, and I can even kind of like tolerate listening to some of the Misfits stuff from time to time. Though, whew, talk about overexposure. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but Gorilla Biscuits doesn't. Gorilla Biscuits doesn't fall into that baby's first punk aesthetic which is maybe where they're like kind of different in the entry level punk way like they don't have there's there's no safety pins there's no you know it's no sex pistols rip up artwork (laughs) you know like it's not that kind of like this is gonna freak out my parents because when you look at like the the lyrical messages of (laughs) a lot of gorilla biscuits it's it's like don't do drugs. Be respectful to other people. <laughs> so, yeah, that is the that is the funny thing about Youth Crew is that it was its own kind of like reaction to the what counter- was ca- counterculture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It was just like, OK, like punks were leather jackets, safety pins, mohawks and stuff like that. And then Youth Crew turned around being like Letterman jackets, like pompadours, kind of like greased back hair, at least like crisp like wearing the crispest clothes that you can like nice shoes what was the, what that band that <laughs> that band we booked the show in hickory and we were joking about this band they didn't have room for the gear in their van because they were too busy <laughs> loading it up with uh they had new new balances in the boxes new <laughs> yeah. they didn't have room for their amps <laughs> and you know, the swatch watches with the big X on it, like all this stuff. It was just this very much like it's kind of funny because it was like their rebellion was to be more wholesome, <laughs> which could only happen in like scuzzy 80s New York City, you know. Yeah, right. So, yeah, the the context of of it is that New York City is in like decades of crime. You know, it's <laughs> like insanely run down, extremely violent super dangerous and like the countercultural scene is just like reveling in that kind of like you know mob controlled <laughs> like you know nightclub atmosphere and they're like we're going to be sock hop hardcore <laughs> <laughs> And so, like, Gorilla Biscuits are, like, you you mentioned them being kind of entry-level punk, and they are entry-level especially if you're approaching it from straight edge. Yeah. Because in all reality, you go, this minor threat band's pretty cool. Yeah, 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 they came up with this whole thing called Straight Edge. Like, oh, that's cool. I'd like to know more about this Straight Edge. I'd like to subscribe to your newsletter. And (laughs) they're like, okay, the second one you got to listen to is Gorilla Biscuits. It, It really is. It's... Even though chronologically, Youth of Today beat them, you know, to some stuff, Youth of Today's three on the list. And honestly, you might skip Youth of Today and then, like, pick a later, like, a th- <laughs> like if you're just, like, you want all the examples of straight edge through time, all right, after that, we'll do Earth Crisis. Like, we'll yeah. skip Youth of Today and go to Youth, Youth, Youth Crisis and then throw down. Like, if you're following, like, the, you're jumping the big peaks, the waves, you know? Yeah, yeah, each class, you're looking for the, you know the freshman the new freshman but (laughs) yeah it kind of depends on also like what direction you want to go with straight edge like do you want to go do you want to go militant do you want to go like this is personal choice (laughs) (laughs) and like it makes sense for gorilla biscuits to be kind of like the second step from like minor threat because minor threat was like they didn't really even i mean they didn't even ian hated it like he hated that people even came up with it as like a a prescriptive lifestyle like he was just like i'm just not 
interested in doing this. Gorilla Biscuits kind of like carries it into like, I hear what you're saying, Ian. This is a little bit of an ideology, though, but it's one that we want to like encourage people to join because we can have fun and make music and work for the betterment of society if we're spending less time on drugs and alcohol and, you know, that kind of like this atmosphere that isn't, you know, it's not really rebelling against anything, especially in like New York City. But but it's it's it kind of stops at the point of being like, I'm going to beat you up for selling drugs (laughs) in my neighborhood. You're going to get fucking jumped. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gorilla Biscuits are like their their brand of straight edge is so gentle that I was I actually Googled to make sure I wasn't wrong. I was like, let me make sure they're they're actually straight edge. I knew they were straight edge, but I was like, but there's like only like one song on here that really explicitly says they don't do drugs and don't drink. And even then, that's buried in a song about just being like, and, you know, I don't I don't want to waste my time on that kind of, you know, I don't, you know, we only got, you know, there's a couple of songs on here where it's about just being like making the most of every moment. It's like these like, I guess this is the the posy hardcore thing that people kind of make fun of. Just because it's 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 relentlessly positive on this record. It's New Direction. New Direction itself is more about talking about the hardcore scene in general. But like Start Today is literally about like, why don't we just, you know, try and make a difference right now? Why don't we try and do something different now and make the most of it? And then like First Failure is about like, you're going to mess up. And it's OK. It, it's just this very like. <laughs> Go get him, champ. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just very like positive and just like pma positive mental attitude like it's funny how like yeah wholesome is really what it is it's just like we don't do drugs and we try and do the best we can at everything we do it's like <laughs> life's a struggle man <laughs> but you can't give up oh we you can't talk to your friends like that you know like that's the that's the other one you know it's like oh we can't we have to be thoughtful about how we talk to each other it's it all wonderful messages really like they're they're really like i get why gorilla biscuits became this like band that people really latched on to because it is like this motivational hardcore and i mean the youth crew scene was kind of like that and even like when you get into like shelter and the krishna core stuff even then that's still like a different kind of motivational <laughs> but it's like i guess that's a little bit more inner inner yeah. you know self-realization type stuff with them but yeah i mean that's like yeah there's that's got the spiritual aspect of like being in tune with the creator of the universe (laughs) (laughs) it's kind of the intention so uh, there's there's a lot to like kind of like joke about like it's so you know relentlessly positive as you said it's like it's so squeaky clean and it's like you know it it feels kind of like what are you rebelling against you, it, this feels like you're like you know, this, it, it feels less rebellious it feels less like it, it feels less radical in the way that it doesn't have necessarily the like it avoids the destructive bent of punk up to this point which was an attitude of like you know it could be self-destructive it could just be it could be hourly destructive it could be like aimed at tearing down systems and like Gorilla Biscuits is saying like you've done you've been doing all of this and it's not changing anything change who you are and change how you relate to other people to bring about change on a bigger scale and that's something that gets like you kind of have to like really that's something that when you sing it it feels a little like fluffy and like hard to pin to any real like mechanical aspects of the world like it's it sounds like niceties and i think that's where it can be really easy to gloss over the ways that gorilla biscuits were a very pretty radical band and i think that it's it's worth digging into like especially the ways that they were like youth crew youth crew in particular like the ways that it was like specifically anti-racist and like Mm -hmm. you know like that's like a really tangible thing that i feel like you can point to as being like this is where and i think i think youth crew doesn't even really properly get the recognition for this but i do think that it is one of the kind of along with the discord scene in general and like bad brains like is where the 
current well i mean it its immediate impact was like the 90s you know pc punk like thing and then how that kind of leads into the current really from that point onward like leftist leaning political mindset of punk i i don't think that youth crew gets enough what i'm saying is doesn't get enough recognition for being like very influential on that it, it is funny too though you you mentioned this song the song degradation is the specific one that's like calling out racism and like literal non- nazis in their yeah. scene like that song was referring to like let's get these fuckers out of here which it which shows that they still had a little bit of that when they are new york hardcore kids you know, like there's yeah. a little bit of that edge where they're like oh we'll fuck a nazi up though you know like that yeah. kind of attitude but yeah i don't <laughs> i don't get the impression that gorilla biscuits were strictly pacifist i don't think no no they they existed within hardcore in 80s new york so yeah. i'm sure they fought some people yeah and they're straight edge you know which straight edge people tended to be kind of targets because they're a little bit targets a little bit like egotistical too there is an egotism to some straight edge people that like is very off-putting to non-straight edge people and so i could see that being like we know of the fights that straight edge bands and non straight edge people had in New York at the time. So it's not that they had to know how to defend themselves. At least they're not like, I mean, they're not, even though like Ray Cap is like a, a, a Krishna guy, like he's not like a George Harrison or like a, <laughs> you know, he's being attacked and he's just saying, Hari, Hari Krishna, you know, as he's being attacked, you know, no, Ray Cap was going to fight you back, you know? <laughs> but even though like, even they're like, because Cats and Dogs is considered a vegetarian vegan song. And yeah. it's so it's so gentle in its delivery, too. It's like, it's just, I care about all animals, even the ones that aren't cute. Like, or uh, all living beings. And the way it reads, you could almost be like, including people. But I think it's meant to be like, I'm a vegan or I'm a vegetarian. And then, it, you know, a couple of years later, it's like Earth Crisis will murder you for eating meat, you know? Like, <laughs> so I guess we could talk about. We mentioned them being entry level. They definitely were an entry level band for us. We were straight edge for a while. And, you know, like you, you, it's one of those things where you, you learn what straight edge is after the fact. You're like, oh, is that me? It's like, I mean, I guess you haven't done anything, though. So, like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. not much of a choice being made here, but yeah. And then it kind of became this like pseudo identity. Uh, for me, I think it got a little bit more of an identity. And, so, yeah, you go Minor Threat and you go, what's the next one? It's Gorilla Biscuits. So, like, Gorilla Biscuits would have been, like, the next, like, thing I really would have got into. So, definitely was all over their two re- major releases. You know, prior to this, they had the, this isn't their debut release. There was a 7-inch prior to this. There is a compilation that has, like, other stuff, too, like, comp appearance songs and, like, demos and stuff like that. So, like, I, I've... Listen to all of the Gorilla Biscuits discography quite a bit in my teens and 20s. And and while I'm not straight edge anymore, I still hold a kind of a really special place for for Gorilla Biscuits. Because I think they're one of the bands that like for straight edge people who are no longer straight edge, which then if you talk to the real straight edge people, they said, if you're not straight edge now, you never were. (laughs) (laughs) Which I don't know. We don't even have to we don't have to get like super into like the problems i have with straight edge but like if that's that feels very reductive (laughs) like like, not even like kosher is like that strict like (laughs) like if you don't know you're not like if you don't know you're breaking kosher you're not considered having broken kosher like you know like so if they're more forgiving i don't know but (laughs) let's lighten up about the x club (laughs) Um, Which Gorilla Biscuits are light. They are the lighter yeah. version of that. So, and so is Ian Mackay, you know. And uh, yeah, so yeah, they were definitely my one of my gateways into like punk and hardcore, and they would have been one of the ones that I latched onto pretty pretty early on in my punk development, getting into everything, everything older.
Yeah, so Gorilla Biscuits was... I consider them entry level because they're one of those bands, and they're probably like, if you really want to parse it down, they're probably like second wave. You know, as we've said, like it's the next step from from Minor Threat. But like in terms of like our exploration into like punk and hardcore, they were probably among that like the the beginning of the next wave of like new bands that we were discovering. Uh, I I I wish I could line up like oh I. I listen to this band and then I listen to this band and then I listen to this band. And, but I, there's inevitably stuff that I'm going to put out of order, but like it definitely went from like misfits to like dead Kennedy's to like minor threat to bad brain, you know, black flag, you hit like the bigger, bigger names first. And then we went probably pretty quickly from minor threat and bad brains stage of exploring punk to gorilla biscuits and I'm trying to think of who else to put in that in that wave of bands that we explored but they were i distinctly remember having several gorilla biscuits songs burned to a cd yeah um that i would listen to a lot and it was like i probably labeled it classic hardcore so it would have just been stuff that was where we were like meticulously labeling this is classic hardcore in our <laughs> itunes library <laughs> Yeah. Classic punk, classic hardcore. <laughs> um, it's old, which really, if you just would have put the years on it, then it would have been, you know, but we weren't keeping track of that kind of stuff yet. Yeah. Yeah, definitely very informative, very, very uh, instrumental in our tastes developing over time. Because at the same time, you're still like absorbing modern music, too. So like you have to like you weave in the new stuff with the old stuff that you're incorporating, you're, you know, you're learning about. And so. Yeah, there's definitely a lot, a lot there. I would say I probably listened to Gorilla Biscuits sometime in between Minor Threat and hearing Fugazi for the first time. Yeah, yeah, that's probably around the same time period. Uh, I have a little bit of their backstory as well. Not too, too much, really. But so they formed after Smilius and Siv met while they were in high school. I don't know if they were in the same school, but they were both in high school at the time. Uh, they were mutual friends of mutual fans of Agnostic Front, and they started going to CBGBs for shows. And this is where they met like Ray Capo and John Por- Porcelli and like others that would help make up the youth crew scene. And then they uh, they asked Siv to sing in a band because they wanted to start a new band, and he didn't really want to do it initially, and he would like face the wall. Or like look at the floor during like early shows and gigs. They would play these shows and not really even have a name yet. It wasn't until like they were like playing a show and somebody's like, you got to have a name. And so then they're like, they named themselves Gorilla Biscuits after a brand, uh, not brand, but like a type of Quaalude at the time, which was like, they was called that. They were called Gorilla Biscuits or Ape Shit. Uh, So I love the alternate reality where this band is called Ape Shit. (laughs) (laughs) But they're called that because they're like these like massive pills. Uh, and it's just very funny to be like a straight edge hardcore band naming themselves after a drug, a downer like that. <laughs> it's very funny because uh, also called fender benders and ape wafers. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, they released their debut self-titled seven inch in 1988, helped bring up the youth crew movement with the youth of today and a lot of the members in the band would play or I did play in other New York hardcore bands at the time, like Judge, Warzone, Youth of Today, Project X. Like, they were all playing. Oh, man. I'm just now putting together that Gorilla Biscuits, it's a they're, it's a gorilla turd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ape shit. <laughs> oh, it makes their names so much worse. <laughs> Because I've always thought it was a bad band name. <laughs> I think, too, it's this... They've taken that word. Like, you can't say Gorilla Biscuits anymore and actually be referring to Quaaludes anymore. Yeah, like, they've taken it and it only means them now. Like, it's, yeah. it's lost all of its original source meaning. Because they probably stopped making Quaaludes in 1989. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, like, they have a short run. Like, this is their debut full length and it's their only full length. Like, they intended to go in the studio and record a second LP. Uh, They started writing songs. There is a song that was, like, written and recorded live called, like, The Distance. But, like, it's not been 
it was not recorded in the studio. And but then they broke up in 1992. And then like a lot of them went on to do other stuff. Like I say half the band went and formed Civ with Civ and then Quicksand came about out of it. So like their run is very short. It's like from 86 to 92 with like nothing being released until 88. So the real window of their impact is was that four years? Yeah. So like it's a tiny little period where they were active and they meant wound up meaning a lot in the long run. And like I tried to find video from them performing while they were active originally, like the initial run of them being active. And the crowds like there's one that's like a CBGB show from 1988 and like the crowds into it. But a CBGB is in like I feel like the youth crew stuff was like really blowing up there. There's like another the Reseda show of them playing in 89. It's pretty, pretty calm crowd wise. It's not too wild, not like a shit ton of crowd surfers or anything like that. And then there was like another live set from like 91. And even then it was like pretty calm ish. It's not until you like you look at the reunion videos now where it's just like, oh, there's like 900 people running across the stage like the entire time and (laughs) crowd surfing like crazy. And the energy is like so ratcheted up. Like, I feel like the shows they do now are way wilder than most of the shows they were playing when in their initial run, just because that I think that's just how much they mean to people now. Yeah, they hadn't they hadn't had the impact yet. They were a new band that people were seeing for the first time pretty often. You know, mm. if they toured outside of New York City, there's a very large chance that most of the people in the audience have never seen them before, have maybe not even heard of them before. Yeah. Like I said, with that 91 show in Reseda or the 89 show in Reseda where they were like, it may not even be out here yet. Like, yeah. That's why they didn't even play that much from the record because they're like, nobody out here knows these new songs yet, you know. And watching them play, because the original lineup was only a four, a three piece, no, a four piece, because they only had one guitarist on the first seven inch. And so like the second or for the LP, they have two guitarists and seeing them live. I'm like, oh, they don't know how to play the old songs with two guitars. Like, it's very funny to watch them play them because it's like, well, what do we do? I guess we both just play the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> And then when they play the news, like the new songs, it's like, oh, there they are. Like, that's that's the sound. You know, I guess, you know, we've gone an hour and we haven't really talked about like the songs or the music themselves. We talked about like the lyrics, I guess, and like the meaning of everything. But like the actual music itself. Do you remember the last time you listened to it? Oh, man, let's crack up in my uh, time <laughs> machine. <laughs> I listened to this album in 2021. Oh, fairly recent then. July of 2021. Weird. I have no scrabbles between now and 2009. 2009, I have three scrabbles. Uh, so that doesn't mean I didn't listen to it in that time period, but it just means that I wasn't connected to my last FM. I feel like I've listened to it in the last couple of years, but not. I can't. I can't pinpoint like an exact moment where I was like, I'm gonna listen to Start Today. Uh, I definitely listened to the one band five songs episode that Dave Brown did on Gorilla Biscuits. So that would have been a couple tracks there that I would have listened to. And I maybe even listened to it right after or at least like half of the album. Just because like that is one thing about this record is like anytime I hear a song from it, I'm like, man, I want to hear I want to hear that record. Like just hear it. So revisiting it. I mean, it hadn't been that long for you to revisit. But so, how do you yeah, feel? So- so prior to 20, I have no memory of listening to it in 2021. That is so weird. Were prior, you working out? <laughs> I don't know what I was doing. That was right before I moved here, moved to L.A. So that was like the month that we were moving. Prior to that, I think it was like 2015, 2014 was like the last period of time where I was like listening to Gorilla Biscuits. 2014, I probably listened to that at work. Um, (laughs) this is a really good record that has some great songs on it. Some really, really good songs, like some all time hardcore songs on it. And probably just as many songs that I can absolutely never remember. (laughs) They're not unlistenable when you hear them. They're fine. Like, but they feel the same. Each time you hit one of those songs on this record, you're like, yeah, that's that one again. 
I've heard that one. It's the da 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 like <laughs> the ones that are mostly just a f- that fast like for the whole song. They don't have that thing. They don't have that anthemic chorus. They don't have that like lead guitar part. They they blur together, which is which is weird to say. Like it feels weird to say of this like hugely influential classic record like something that like you could very easily make like a thousand and one records you need to hear case for this record the amount of material on it that you can totally skip and it doesn't hurt the record to lose it is surprising uh, yeah i mean i guess there it has that thing that a lot of hardcore records have where they're just like and this is a song like it's just kind of like and it's a fast song that's on the record like it's kind of like how you feel about it it's but even then like even my lowest rating on here i'm i'm pretty high on this whole album my lowest track was a 3.75 and it was good intentions and it's the the fourth track and some of the some of them i gave was just like 4.0s just because it's just being solid just solid all around tunes I feel like maybe the lyrics are what give this is weird. Like I'm not like a lyrics studier when I listen to music, but this was a record that I listened to. Like I was reading the lyrics as I was listening to the album. And so I think they kind of like boost it. Yeah. A little bit more. If you're, you know, like even like the songs that I'm like, I gave time flies a 4.0, but even then I'm like, it's a song about getting old and you know, like, which carries so much more weight now, especially when they play it live and like, or, Stand still, you know, it's stand still is a song about watching TV and how it's a waste of time playing, yeah. playing, playing Mario is a waste of time. You know, like <laughs> we just that's a, playing Donkey Kong all day. Yeah, that's what not I was getting Donkey nothing Kong. done. <laughs> uh, that song has the line. Is it a brain vacation or mental masturbation? <laughs> <laughs> and even then, wait I'm till like, these yeah. dudes find out about TikTok. <laughs> But so, yeah, there's like, yeah, there's a handful of songs where it's just kind of like eh, it's a straightforward hardcore song. It's like doesn't do anything like super special. The standout tends to be the lyrics. But then you have let's talk about the the iconic songs on this record. First track, New Direction, the trumpet intro. Greatest intro to a record, a hardcore record ever. It's absurdly grandiose. Like it is <laughs> one of the biggest flex moves <laughs> like to start off your record with this like revelry <laughs> that for all time will be associated with this record. <laughs> is it, what is it? It's not credited to anyone. So it must be a sample, right? There's no horn credits on the album. Let me see if I can find it. I don't know if anyone knows where it came from. It must. I wonder if it was just like sampled from like, Oh man, there's probably like a, military brass band <laughs> LP or something that they just got it from. What's cool is what they do now is they, they hire horn players in every city they go to. And so like, it's different people playing that horn intro every time. Now they play it live and that's how they start their show. I mean, you have the greatest intro ever. Like you're going to start every single show going forward. And I, their way of making it fun is, I guess, by picking a different horn, you know, not instead of bringing a horn player with them just to do the revelry and le- you know, not play anything else. So like they get people from the area. Some people can do it pretty close. No one does it exact. It And it's funny how it's like, oh, you know how to play a trumpet, but you don't know what the notes are. <laughs> and so you just start kind of noodling here. If you watch them on TikTok, that's like the number one thing that you see on TikTok with Gorilla Biscuits is an intro to New Direction. And then but so, yeah, it's got the coolest little like horn intro. But then the song itself goes with this just like that, that ring out like that riff, the, the toms and kick going crazy. And then it just bursts into like a fast, heavy loud song and it's just like it may just be like the best intro to a a harker record ever like just between the horns and the way the guitar comes in the drums and everything just works together so well it's incredible incredible that's like a all-time classic to me i think then degradation really stands out for being mainly for the message the song itself i think is 
kind of standard hardcore, but the message I think is what really makes that one special. The mid-song tempo break in Degradation into the two-step is really good. Yeah. Uh, Things We Say is another one of my like all-time favorites. And it's it's nothing like super duper like unique song wise. But then start today, like the title track, that that intro riff, the reverb echo on it, the fact that it has this like really fun groove to it. It's kind of like mid paced for the album. It's not like one of the fastest song. It's just like a slow mid tempo groove song. Just a really, really fun song that then has this like harmonica <laughs> bridge on it that's just like out of nowhere like that is a that that song alone is like probably one of the greatest hardcore songs ever written and then yeah like competition's a really fun song it's got like the whistle the whistling in it and i guess it like it, it kind of ends kind of weak like time flies and cats and dogs again stronger for their lyrical content than necessarily their songs uh sitting around at home that's a buzzcocks cover and the self-titled like the gorilla biscuits song these both of those songs are hidden tracks there are unlisted tracks is how they're yeah. listed on the cd so the true ending of the record is cats and dogs but then they throw in their cover and their and their novelty song to end the yeah. actual where you hear ray capo <laughs> them spelling gorilla biscuits like i don't know that's what one two three four Oh, a first failure. First failure is just so much fun. Yeah, first failure is great. I see there's like six like all time classics on this album. And yeah, like and even like I said, even the weakest tracks, I feel like are still really fun for their lyrical content. And they're short. I mean, there's nothing here that's like they're not going on and on with any of the weakest songs here. The weakest songs are pretty short. Uh, Good Intentions is literally 30 seconds long. So it's kind of like. It's almost unique in how quick it is and how efficient it is, which gives it kind of a little more almost makes it a stronger song by being so short. Yeah, it's yeah, it's just it's it's funny to me that it's this record with like these like kind of tentpole songs. And then like the in between is like there there's really no. And I mean, I guess it's just because there's been such limited amounts of Gorilla Biscuits material for anyone to like dig into that. And it's not like it was something that would have been released. You know, there wouldn't have been singles released from it. Like it was the album. That was it. Like, you know, they, they didn't do promo for individual songs from the record. So it's, it's a record that you, when you revisit it, or when you listen to it for the first time, having heard all of the big songs from it, you're not going to find any deep cuts. Like the the songs that have made it off of this album onto punk venue playlists, those are all of the best songs on the album. There's no secret song on here, here where you're like, oh, that one's that one's so good. Like people should talk about this one more. Like all of the really good songs people talk about from this record you've heard them they're played somewhere you're not you're not gonna find anything i guess is is what is maybe surprising about it in terms of its legacy it's not something that is like continually rewarding you're not having a novel experience every time you listen to it which would i feel like you would it would make you think like that it's a record that you would enjoy less each time you listen to it but I don't, I don't enjoy it less. <laughs> I enjoy well, it about the same. Like I'm every time, and it's maybe it's helped by only by having a few years in between most listens. That it's just, it's not something I'm listening to constantly, and it's never going to be something that I listen to constantly. But it's fun to revisit it, it and go like, man, I love those six songs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It, I don't. I don't think it's an album that you're meant to take songs off, like and listen to them on your own. Like you're not going to take good intentions, which I, I forgot is only 25 seconds long. And you're not going to take that and just be like, put it on a mixtape. You know, like there's, it's not that kind of record. The album in its, its Spotify version is 24 minutes. That includes the two unlisted tracks. The actual, like, I guess LP version is 20 minutes long. So like, I, it's, 
it's meant to be just kind of taken as one big chunk of music because they didn't release any individual singles for the record. Like it wasn't that kind of they didn't promo single anything. It was just here's the record. It's out. Everybody get it. You know, like so like I, I don't know. I don't think any of these like oh just because like, you know, Time Flies isn't the most like interesting composed song that it really takes anything away from the record because it's the longest song on here is the opener new direction it's two minutes and 25 seconds 20 of that's probably the trumpet you know trumpet intro yeah. so like nothing ever says it's welcome it is interesting i looked at rate your music has like you can rate tracks individually and good intentions is the lowest rated song it's 25 seconds long it's a 3.5 but then next to that's time flies it's a 3.6 there's a couple 3.7s, uh, First Failure and Cats and Dogs. And then like everything else is like a 3.8, 3.9, with the exception of New Direction and Start Today, which are both 4.0 and 4.1. So I don't know. I, I, yeah, you're right. There's no deep cuts because there's not it's not that deep to dig into. Like it's so short that you're going to get through it so fast. It's like Minor Threat Records. Like there's there's Minor Threat songs that you're like, well, if I listen to this out of context of Minor Threats out of step, I'm not going to get anything out of it. Or even like some of the black flag songs that are just like the, like the super fast ones that are just whatever. They're nothing like really special. I don't know. I don't take them out of the context. Doesn't hurt anything to me. That is, that is a interesting point to make that there. It's funny to me that hardcore was like, it's the, it's the more extreme version of punk. Like it was, it was the next step of punk. So they were like, everything's faster everything's harder and for most of the first 10 years of hardcore the fastest stuff with the exceptions of like bad brains is probably the least interesting material to come from hardcore as a genre (laughs) like for all of the classic bands their fastest songs are like the most forgettable ones they're just like that was it that was over. I couldn't really distinguish anything that was happening in the guitars. <laughs> the vocals were just da 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 da. I don't know what he said. So you know that's not Gorilla Biscuit's fault. But yeah, that that was know. kind I, of just hardcore. I think if you have like six standout tracks on a twenty-minute album, I think you've succeeded in making a great album. <laughs> like, and it's not like the first three songs and you turned it off record. Like you know, yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense to start today's the beginning of the B-side, perfectly timed place. And if you look at it from a, like a A-side, B-side structuring, too, they sandwiched it pretty well. Yeah. So the band, you know, broke up in 92. They starred Civ and Quicksand after they would reunite for a one-off show in 1997 as a benefit. Then in 2005, they reunited, which then starts off their kind of career as a legacy act where they do the festival thing play a lot they did actually are they're on like an international tour this year uh and that's why you see they're playing every single festival this year i'm probably not going to fest this year and i'm pretty bummed because you know gorilla biscuits are playing fest this year but they're playing like furnace they played this is hardcore they're probably playing riot i think they might be playing riot it's like quicksand and and gorilla biscuits are like on this like we're gonna play every festival together this year and so now it's like you can just see the Gorilla Biscuits now, which is also really wild. Before, like the reunions were a little bit more special, a little more spaced out. And so it would be like, oh, OK, we, we have a chance to see them at this big fest. You know, um, it's nice that people have let the all lives matter thing go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I yeah, that that was a little thing that was like it was like a blip, basically. I think it was a misconstrued take on what he was trying to say because yeah the whole the, the thing about like people say black like wear black lives matter shirts and he's like no shit all lives matter black brown you know like he does all that that thing yeah and i think in his he, mind what he was saying was of course we're all in this together you know like it's just this like fuck these fucking racists of course all these lives matter was kind of yeah. his because he played it right. He said all that shit right before Degradation, which is the anti-Nazi song. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The point the point that he was clearly making was like the actual ideal point that you would want to make when making that statement is to say, like, it's ridiculous that we have to specifically name yeah. a group of people and say that their lives matter. Yeah. Uh, like he w- he's 
he just didn't realize that it was a dog whistle. <laughs> yeah. He was like accidentally using a phrase that racists use to make the bad faith point that we don't need to specifically talk about the issues that affect black people because everyone is yeah. suffering. Like, yeah. And he even still is doing a similar speech this year. Like it's a similar speech, but it's more of like, uh, He's still using the colors, which I find is such an old guy thing to be like, I don't care if you're black, white, yellow, red, purple, blue, you know, like that. Kind of, so it's sort of funny, like, I'm not racist. And then you're like, I don't care if you're if you're an alien from Mercury, <laughs> like that kind of thing. It's like, all right, all right, all right. You can cool it with that kind of stuff. He still does that. He's like, I don't know if you're cute. If you're, but now he's like included, like, if you're gay or straight or queer or whatever. And then you know, all that kind of stuff, too. It's 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 very funny because I listened <laughs> he he Siv I think has a is is a dumb guy I think is ultimately what it is because on the uh the first Siv record there's like a thing where he like calls people pussies um <laughs> and then on the Gorilla Biscuits uh 7 inch that they did with like those two brand new songs in like 2006 it's like at the matinee is the first song and then the song he's like yeah we're all, we're all, like a bunch of our words <laughs> and it's just like hey hey siv come on <laughs> we don't say these words i mean it was 2006 so like unfortunately too many people were still saying that word but yeah he's just like his statements of it's like the intent is always like good and he means well but it is very he has just been like and i said it in the most blunt dumb guy way of saying it. <laughs> i said it I said it the worst way possible. <laughs> and like, like you said, like, and cause even like the very next day he made, he made it, he kind of clarified it. He was just like, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not one of those guys. I'm not like a, you know? Yeah. I didn't mean it that way. Yeah. And I think most, he, he earned everything that they've done over the years. He's earned the right to be like, Hey, can I clarify that real quick? You yeah. Know? And everybody kind of like forgave him, you know. It wasn't like the the what was the the chokehold one, the who it was the the beating up a trans woman in the audience. Yeah, yeah. And his response was, "I didn't know." It's like, shut up. Yeah, yeah. yeah that one that one was like, did you really need to go fight this person in the audience though? Right. Are we still doing that? Yeah. But yeah, so I think Siv like's just you know he's uh, he's probably what I don't know how old Siv is now. And I don't think he's like, we know he doesn't play video games, so he's probably not on the Internet that much. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't up on the current Internet lingo. But yeah, I wasn't even really going to bring that up just because I very clearly like it was like a dumb blip that like immediately was. Oh, yeah. Forgotten and given, you know, forgiven. No, yeah. I mean, I just figured it was I thought it was interesting. It's the good. It, it's worth mentioning because of the goodwill that Gorilla Biscuits has garnered over decades of just like it's it's that was something that like people moved past so quickly because it's been so clear for so long that they're well-meaning people that they're like capable of learning that they you know that that from the beginning as teenagers in new york city they were like singing anti-racist songs you know like it's it, it just it goes down to the core of who they are and which again is like my i guess back to my earlier point of being like what is so radical one of the things that is so radical radical i can't say the word radical what are you what are you saying radical radical. (laughs) something that is so radical about gorilla biscuits is that they're old punk guys who haven't regressed too yeah like they're like they have continued not without making mistakes to become better people like I think that that's that's something that goes back to to the beginning with them, that they're like always striving to be better people. Yeah. Uh, I You know, the Internet is continuing to be a really terrible place to try and find any like reviews of anything anymore. I could only find like an enemy calling it one of the 15 greatest hardcore albums of all time. All music gave it a 4.5 stars and said, focusing on the hyper rants of lead singer Siv and pushed along with loud and chunky guitar riffs by Walter Schreifels later of Quicksand. The record sees the band tackle topics ranging from pets to friends and even to pride in the hardcore scene. It's certainly not without its politics, but the tone is surprisingly light and Siv is clearly giving his opinion more than he's trying to convince others of anything, which 
it's true. He he has come across more of like this is what I feel, and not so much you need to conform to my feet, my thoughts, you know. Like yeah. That. <laughs> And then there's a scene point blank review that says, simply put, Start Today is one of the greatest hardcore records that has ever been written. And there is no way that you can argue against that statement of fact. And if you try, you are not just fooling yourself, but also robbing yourself of the experience of hearing one of the most innocent and pure odes to being young, bored, and way too much energy for anyone's own good that has ever been written in the history of music. And I guess, like, the only thing left is, like, what would you what would you rate this? I like I'm going five stars. It's a five star classic for me. Definitely a thousand and one albums to hear before you die entry for me. I would say it's probably a four and a half. I, it's just not quite perfect. Dylan, don't like hardcore. I think it. <laughs> there, there's just enough like material that is like that I gloss over every single time I listen to it that it's not it's not a five stars, but an incredible record. Absolutely important. Like it's one of the like here, listen to this records like. Yeah, it's just everyone needs to have heard it at some point as a punk. It's like one of the few truly canonical records, I feel like. Like you need to have at least heard the best songs from it. I'll say that much. But you need to know who Gorilla Biscuits are and why they're important. (laughs) All right. Well, I think that will do it. Uh, So I guess all that leaves is now for us to figure out what year I have to choose an album from. I mean, I guess I'll leave it up to you. Do you want me to keep the same challenge, same topic, debut album? Yeah, let's do a debut. All right, let's see. Let's plug in our random number generator. 1976, the year of the first Ramones records to today. And I'm just going to hit it once. And it is the year. Oh, my fucking God. 1988. 2022. Oh, no. All right. This is your call. It's you know, I'm the one who's being challenged. Um, <laughs> do you want me to draw again or you want me to keep this 2022? I mean, it, it might only be fair because 89 was pretty hard. Yeah, do it. All right. Find 2022. A, find, me, find me an essential debut Jesus. album from 2022. It's, oh, my. It's got to be on par with Gorilla Biscuit. <laughs> That's the claim that you are staking for this selection. All right, twenty new direction of twenty twenty two. Jesus, uh, the start today of twenty twenty two. Yeah. All right. Well, well, prepare for a low downloaded episode because nobody likes the twenty twenties. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see what. I, God, you got to figure out what even is a debut from last year. I'm gonna have to dig. I'm gonna have to dig for a while. I think. <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll refer, man. And I probably don't even want to choose something that we like covered extensively on, like the best of the year. I don't know. All right, this is a this is a challenge for sure. I mean, at least there's the angle of like, did this hold up over the last year? <laughs> <laughs> this album that came out in October hold up? Uh, eight months later, nine, or ten months later. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening, and you can follow us on all forms of social media. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Blue Sky, and Threads. We're on all of them. I wish someone would pick the rest. Uh, pick one that we're going to stick with. Uh, I don't think Threads is winning. So y'all you all need to get on Blue Sky. I've gotten notifications of people that I know from Instagram having recently joined Threads. So they haven't posted anything, but they've joined it. That's like, like most of the user base of Threads is like people who haven't posted anything. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, we'll, uh, I send out those Blue Sky invites when I get them. I sent one out today, so. Yeah, I don't think I've gotten any invites yet. You might. I don't Maybe know. you, you might see it tomorrow. We'll see. But you get one, like, every two weeks, I think, is how it works. So, hmm. yeah. So, yeah, follow us on all that stuff. Instagram, Twitter, yeah, all that. Uh, punklaudapod at gmail.com, and our voicemail line is 202-688-PUNK. So, thank you, everyone for listening and we will talk to you next week. To order punk, call the number on your screen. Rush delivery is available. Remember this special offer is not sold in stores.